Shamil, Shamazel, how oh, some them incorporated. Okay, that's just me testing out my new microphone. And of course, wouldn't you have it that the second I hit record, some dumbass without a muffler on his car. So I was 
was watching that trial and at the end of the playlist at the end of the um like the last um video when she's getting sentenced i kind of was like oh no what am i going to watch now like i'm addicted to watching uh, interrogations uh
teenage girls can be really awful at that age but like I said that's a story for another time um so by the time that um Georgia attended what was called the Urkelwood Technology Center she was quite popular um, around her friends and she was very supportive of her classmates and she was what's called a mental student counselor which over here in the states is basically the same thing as like a mental health counselor and she was also elected what is called head girl and what that means is in some British schools the um, the students the student body they elect a head boy or a head girl kind of like a student body president I guess and if you know anything about Harry Potter then you'll probably remember that from that reference from um, Hogwarts so um, Georgia she was just always wanting to do really really well and to excel was very important to her and so she would strive to get um, all A's and then on her spare time she um, she was an air cadet where she held the rank of corporal I mean this girl really had her life together she knew exactly what she wanted to do and she also volunteered as a member of the Match Day safety team and that's at a local football club called AFC Telford United so because Georgia was such an independent person and her parents they pretty much like um, they were very supportive of her and her sister Scarlett they're wonderful parents and they both very much appreciated their parents and Georgia wanted to kind of help out and not like um, rely and depend on her parents for everything especially at 17 she kind of wanted a taste of what it's going to be like when she's on her own and so she got a job at a uh, gas station um, well, over in England it's called a petrol, but here it's called gas. So she got a job at a gas station. And when she got that job there, she ended up working with a man. And his name was Jamie Reynolds. I feel like I'm breathing too loud, but I'm, like I said, I'm kind of sick, so I'm sorry if this is sounding really wonky. So now Jamie. Jamie had a whole slew of problems. He just was not your, uh, well, you'll see. Jamie was five years older than Georgia, and he was actually in the same uh, school year as Georgia's oldest, uh, older sister, Scarlett. And Scarlett knew Jamie, but like not very well. She, um, she didn't have any classes with him or anything like that. They were not part of the same social circles or anything like that either. And because of that, you know, she knew of him but didn't know about him. So she really did not have an opinion of him when they were in school. So, um, Georgia, she got to know Jamie, um, because they worked the same shift quite a bit together. And Georgia's family would, when she was working, her family, like her mom, her dad, and her sister, they would make it a habit to kind of pop into the gas station, just not really to check up on her, I guess, just maybe, you know, like, okay, your daughter works at a gas station, it's, it's nice to go in, maybe be a patron of that gas station, so I think that's what they were doing, not really checking on her, so because they did that, they ended up getting to know, um, Jamie as well. And so, um, Georgia, um, she, well, okay, so Jamie took an interest in Georgia, like, not a mild interest either, like, he really took an interest, let me tell you. So, uh, but Georgia, 
she really didn't look at him like that. She thought he was polite, she thought he was nice enough, but she just did not look at him like that. And besides, she had recently started dating um, a boy named Matthew. I think his last name was Bird. I think. Um, and they had just started dating, but um, for some reason, Georgia, at first, didn't mention him. Not because of any nefarious reasons, I don't think, but she just didn't mention him. Maybe she just thought, I don't know, it's not his business, I'm not really sure, but... Um, and so, because he thought she was single, he would frequently, like, ask her out on a date. And at first, she was like, okay with it, but like, told him, like, no, I don't want to go on a date with you, I'm good. And he kind of took it hard, and he also, you know, didn't even pay attention to her saying no, because he kept asking her over and over and over, and she kept telling him over and over and over that she does not want to date him, like, move on. So, he was very, very upset, and then one day, um, they get home from their, uh, respective, um, jobs, and Georgia gets on, um, I think it was MySpace, not Facebook, and she updates it, and she says that she changed her status from single to in a relationship, and Jamie saw that, and he was not happy, and so, um, she, what she put on Facebook, um, of course, saying that she's in a relationship, Jamie decided that he's going to update his status as well, and I'm going to tell you what he said, word for word. Whenever I arrange dates, they either never happen or the girl magically gains a boyfriend. And it's worse when you actually like someone. You're stuck. Happy that they're happy, but unhappy because it's not you. So he continues to send her text message after text message claiming to have like romantic feelings for her and then in one of the messages Georgia just kind of got like sick of it and her message I will tell you word for word said I don't see you in that way just stop I don't want to ruin our friendship I told you last time I just wanted to be friends so that is the message that Jamie got. Well, Jamie was not a very happy man, just in general. He was 22 years old, and his life and career, they were just not going how he wanted. Um, he told Georgia that he wanted to pursue a career in photography, and when he did that, he actually asked Georgia and some other girls to help him out with a project that he was working on for photography. Um, and some of the girls were willing to help him out, so he wanted them to model, and he wanted to use, get this, a simulated hanging as a muse. Did you hear that? A simulated hanging as a muse. And um, Georgia agreed to help him as well as some other girls. So Georgia and Jamie, they ended up making plans to go to Jamie's house. And that was on the evening of May 26th, 2013. And she was going to pose for his project. So, um, Georgia's at her house, and she's getting ready, and, um, she gets a text message from Jamie, and it says, 
this fake hanging. Just wanted to double check to make sure you're cool with it as it's totally safe. So, okay. So she was like, okay, got it. And then, uh, so George's parents, if, in case you're wondering, they, they knew, they were aware of her plans. Um, and they really had no problem with her going to help them because they felt like they had a good, um, like, handle on who Jamie was because they had met him, you know, so many times at that gas station. So they really didn't have a problem with it. And she only lived five minutes away. It was a five minute walk to uh, his house. So, and also, too, the parents were under the impression that, um, Georgia wasn't going to be alone, that there were going to be other girls there, because initially that is what was supposed to be happening. So, okay, so that day, um, Georgia, uh, Georgia's dad, she, he comes home, Steve, he comes home from work, and they had some family visiting them, and it was a really beautiful day out, and the sun was out, and um, so because of that, uh, Steve decides that he wants to have a barbecue, and, um, so he tells his wife that, and the daughter, and the family that's visiting, and so they start setting up to have a barbecue, they go shopping, do everything they need to do, and then George's mom was like, I know you're busy, and I know you want to help your friend today, um, but maybe do you think that you could put it off for maybe another day because we don't really get these visits that often and so Georgia thought about it she mulled it over and she told her mom like look I don't want to disappoint him because you know he has been interested in me and when I told him that I just wanted to be friends he took it really well so I mean I don't want to I promised him something and I don't want to renege on that because I feel like it could ruin our friendship so um, her mom totally understood that and she was like okay you know just go have a good time be careful you know all the usual mom stuff so um, so Georgia is getting ready to go and she gets dressed and um, when she got when she was heading out the door Oh, I don't know if I mentioned this yet. Georgia had this beautiful, long, red, like, dyed hair. And, uh, Jamie had quite a penchant for the red hair. Um, and so she was leaving and she was wearing, like, sk uh, skinny jeans, like, skinny black jeans. She had a baggy top on and a waist-length leather jacket. And as she was leaving her home, her dad joked that she looked like Olivia Newton-John in the movie Grease, which is so cute. Um, they had a laugh about that. So, Georgia leaves her house at 7.30 that night, and she goes to Jamie's house, and Jamie lives there with his mom, his stepfather, and his sister, and, um, they lived on, they lived on a road called Evendale Road in Wellington, and why do I tell you why, what road they live on? Is that really all that important? Well, maybe not, but I kind of, whenever I listen to somebody doing true crime or just in everyday TV shows or movies, if I ever hear anybody uh, mention a place that I know, like a landmark or something, I geek out. <laughs> so that's really the only reason why sometimes I even, um, mention the names of the roads or something that they live on. So, okay, so like I said, Evendale Road in Wellington. Well, Jamie's parents were not going to be there because they were vacationing in Italy, and his sister, was staying at her boyfriend's house for the night, so it's it was just going to be Jamie and Georgia, but 
did not know that she was under the impression when she got there that there would be a bunch of other girls uh, there too. Oh my goodness, it started thundering out. Are you kidding me? Oh, I'm sorry if this if this recording comes out terrible with the thunder. I'm so sorry. So, okay, so like I said, yeah, so she thought that there would be other girls there, but whatever, like, she got there, he told her, like, oh, they canceled, and she was like, okay, no big deal, let's, let's do this, so, um, so, Jamie, he hands her an outfit, he had gone out, and he had bought a specific outfit for Georgia to wear, and it was a leather jacket, which she already was wearing one, so, that's kind of weird, but it was a leather jacket, it was a pair of, um, leather shorts and high heels. So around 8 p.m., she models in the kitchen, and then she goes upstairs, and as they planned, she posed with a noose around her neck in the upstairs hallway. And the way he had it was... She was standing on a box with, uh, like her hands were, um, like freely swinging by her sides and the noose was attached to an oar, like a boat oar and that, um, that had been like, um, like hanging off of a loft hatch so he would like slide it through there and then he put the noose over that so he takes George's pictures and um like I said her hands were unbound and the noose around her neck and then he decides that he wants to put her in a different position and he binds her hands up now tied behind her back and when he does this, he kicked away the box that she was standing on. <sighs> so then, he takes her body and he puts it on his parents' bed. And then he sexually assaults her for over an hour. He dragged her body downstairs and he positioned it all over the house and he took pictures of himself in these sexual positions with her body for several hours so now George is late she's supposed to be home and her parents are wondering where is she it's 10 30 and so George's mom sends her a text message um, and she's asking her you know where she is is everything going okay where are you so jamie takes george's phone pretending to be her and he says that pretending to be her he says that uh she was going out with friends and she even i'm sorry he even um, signed off the message the same way that Georgia typically signed off. But what he did was he put um, three X's, which um, means um, kisses. Like the X's um, mean kisses. Just kind of like how if we have X's and O's, kisses and hugs. Well, over in England, they do X's. So there's these three X's, which are three kisses, which is how she typically signs off. And what that stands for is, I love you, mom, dad, and sister. It was something she typically did, so her parents completely didn't know that anything was off at all. Um, so, um, you know, that message just gave the impression that she had left Jamie's house voluntarily and was going somewhere else for the night. So then Jamie gets in touch with two other um, girls that are George's age, and he cancels the plans that he had made with them for the next day. He had planned on doing this to two other girls as well. 
she ends up getting a reply from Jamie pretending to be Georgia this time saying that Georgia had stayed with friends and she'd be coming home that night the message also said that the battery in her phone was running low so Jamie then sends a text message from his phone to Georgia's sister Scarlett and he also sends a message to Georgia's phone which he was like faking concern um and it was you know just all he was doing was to carry on the pretense that he didn't know where she was so the parents they weren't really too concerned at the time Georgia was nearly 18 years old and they trusted her and um she had a driving lesson booked for the very next day and they knew that there was no way she was going to um, not go to that it was her very first lesson and um, she also had planned to go to a I guess a bunch of like her friends were getting together to watch some musicians kind of like jam out and she was really looking forward to that as well so they thought that Georgia would just go um, like straight to that music thing and then be home after that like when that was all over so now Jamie he takes Georgia's body he wraps it in a blanket puts it in the back of his father, I'm sorry, his stepfather's um, van. It's like a silver Toyota van. And he also loaded her clothes and jewelry in the van, along with other items of clothing that he had brought for the photo shoot. And he packed up some camping equipment, equipment, I can never say that word. Um, so then he ends up calling George's sister Scarlett and he tells her that he is not going to be able to help her out in looking for Georgia because he forgot that he had made plans to go camping. So he bowed out of that. Um, and then right after he did that, that he had taken with the camera and he uploaded them onto an external hard drive and he took that with him as well so he drives for like an hour and he gets to this town called Rexholm which is a town in Wales and with George's body in the back of the van <sighs> this is so disgusting Jamie <sighs> he had some food yeah he ate and then he went to the movies to watch the movie The Fast and the Furious. In fact, it was the same exact film that he had asked Georgia to go to see with him when he was asking her out. So, with her body in the back of the van, this douchebag goes and eats a full meal and sits his ass down at a movie you know, eating popcorn and raisinette and drinking soda and probably like a slurpee or whatever the hell he did but just no, like no problem whatsoever this is just what he does so after that, Jamie gets back in the van and he drives to these secluded um, woods and again, I'm gonna drop a name here in case anybody's listening and they know. It was called, the woods were called Nanty Garth. I hope I said that right. Um, so he actually, he was not really able to drive as far into the woods as he wanted to because it was dark out and he couldn't really see where he was going. So he ends up stopping the van, gets George's body out carries it and just disposes her body in the woods so up until then his plan had been working just exactly the way he wanted um, but for him something was about to take a bad turn and what that is is that the van that he was using got stuck in the mud now this is after 
he dumped her body. His van gets stuck in the mud, and he tries really, really hard to uh, get that out, but he can't do it. It's just too deep in the mud. He cannot do it. So, just a few feet away from where he put uh, George's body, these people that are driving by end up stopping, and they pull over, and they're asking him if he needs help. And so, these people are helping him, and he gets the van out of the mud, and one of the people that helped him later on in the investigation tells one of the investigators that he took a picture of the van before Um, 
wants to go and kill himself now because he never meant to hurt her and he says that he cannot remember what happened to her he was saying that he hated himself he never meant to hurt her and he was also saying that he could only remember dragging her body into the woods through flashbacks yeah so they have a preliminary hearing and he goes before the court and the court heard how Jamie uh, you know had taken her life that morning he appears for just a few minutes and the only thing he confirms is his name his age and his address but everything else he's claiming he doesn't remember any of it so even though um he uh that he could even though he admitted that he could remember moving george's body not so much in doing the actual killing but in moving her body he continues to deny that you know he was that he killed her so while he was on remand he entered a plea of not guilty and that was at a hearing in october of that same year so what does that mean that means excuse me frog in my throat that means that george's family now we're going to have to get um, ready to go through a trial, which was set for December of that year. They were going to have to hear all of this, these terrible things that happened to their daughter, and it was going to be just horrible, 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 but they were having to prepare for it. So now nearly seven months after Georgia had been murdered, and five days before the trial, Jamie decides that he wants to admit that he killed Georgia after all. So, the police end up addressing the, um, the press, and they're telling the press how important that, um, you know, Jamie's saying that he's guilty is and they're saying that it's important i mean for the obvious reasons but also because it allows um the family to grieve without um, having the burden of listening to all the horrible things that he had done to her so okay so now this is the part that like really really bothers me a lot um so now Jamie is on remand, and he, when he was on remand, he was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, two forensic psychiatrists came out to evaluate him, and the first evaluator reported that Jamie witnessed domestic violence towards his mother when he was young and that Jamie had suffered some emotional and physical abuse at the hands of his biological fa father, excuse me, and that um, Jamie's mother was able to escape from that relationship and she ended up making a new life with Jamie's stepfather. And his mother and stepfather provided this really nice life for Jamie and his sister. They were very supporting, and um, the stepfather ended up being a really, like, a loving role, mo role model to Jamie and his sister. And then that same um, person, that, that same forensic psychiatrist, this I don't understand, but he said that it was his opinion that Jamie did not suffer from any recognized mental disorder or any abnormality of psychological functioning. Sorry, I had to read that bit because like there's no way I could have remembered that. So, you know, it was clear that Jamie wanted to hang a woman and have sex with her after death. Um, because he was into necrophilia, if you don't know what that is, that's having sex with a naked body after death. So he also had 
the opinion that Jamie was super intelligent and also capable of learning new tactics and strategies and that he had the potential to become a serial killer. He also said that Jamie poses a risk to himself and that he is a grave risk to women and he will be for the rest of his life. So, um, that forensic evaluator uh, agreed with the other one who was a doctor and that doctor provided two reports. One was like August, the other one was a couple months later or the month after I think and she described Jamie having recurrent intense sexual fantasies involving violence and sadism. Jamie accessed material um, through the internet um, and he wrote stories like he would write stories these crazy stories about what he wanted to do to women. He described having some psychotic symptoms that were linked to his um, like sexual preoccupation and then the doctor, I have to read this part because this blows my mind, the doctor found no basis to diagnose a psychotic illness but could not rule out the possibility of the emergence of a psychotic condition in years to come. I had to sit and think about that one when I read it. So after Jamie pleads guilty to George's murder, some things started to come to light and it was disclosed that Jamie had made attempts to commit these same types of crimes in the past. He had been obsessed with sexual violence for at least five years, particularly women uh, being hanged or strangled and then, you know, them being violated after death. He also had, like I said before, I think that he had this penchant or particular liking for redheads. He would frequently seek out like situations where um, like he was the assailant of the fantasies that he set forth in writing. So by May of 2013, Jamie had a collection of 16,800 images and 72 videos of extreme pornography on his computer and he had written 40 stories which all contained some form of um, fatal attacks on young women um, that he sexually assaulted them after death like I had just said so predominantly it was all you know it was by strangulation asphyxiation you know all that well there are three particular um, events that had happened before all of this and if any of these events were talked about, brought to light, if people spoke to one another like the different agencies, the police, anybody they had seen, anything like that, if they had talked, just spoke to one another none of these things, Georgia would be alive because somebody would have done something, but unfortunately, the ball was dropped way too many times, and, you know, they just didn't do anything, and it's so, wait, wait, do you hear what, <sighs> wait, do you hear what happened, so, I'm so sorry about this freaking frog in my throat, I am sick, so, please forgive me, okay, so, okay, so I'm gonna talk about these three separate instances where Jamie should have not been allowed to even walk like the streets. Okay, so at the start of 2008, Jamie convinced a teenager to go to his house and to do the same thing that he had Georgia do, to model, you know, for a like a fictional media project. And that media project was based on a book. Yeah, on a book. And it was
was the same exact thing that he wanted to do to Georgia. So the teenage girl, she, when she got there, remember how he brought um, Georgia upstairs to the kitchen, right? And then they went from the kitchen to the hallway, um, you know, the, the hallway that he did it. Well, the girl, the teenager, she declines. She's like, nope, I'm not going upstairs. And she didn't want to go into the kitchen either. And so then at that point, Jamie gets all pissed off that she's not doing what he wants her to do because, you know, she's not following the script, I guess, that he wants to have her follow. And so he ends up assaulting her anyway. He's like also pissed off. It's not going his way, so he assaults her. She manages to fight him off. She bites him and she breaks one of his ribs and then she escapes and she goes to the police and what the police do all they do is they give him a final warning and they send him to counseling that is it so while they're investigating that report where that teenager went to the police after he assaulted her they're in a they're investigating that report and the police find pictures of women being strangled and some pictures um so jamie would do this thing where he would go on to facebook and he knew all of these girls that he was friends with and what he would do was he would um lift a picture one of the girls posted a selfie or like with her friends or whatever and he would take the pictures and he would digitally alter them and he would add nooses around their necks and one of the pictures that the police found on his computer was a picture of that girl that was assaulted the one that just told them that she was able to get away from him so they see a picture with her from her Facebook profile and there's a noose around her neck and there's like writing about like he did this um kind of like um so he kept a little book and in it he would like write names of certain girls and then he would give that name a value from one to ten and then he would like make little notations here and there about whatever 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 and with this girl in particular he put not satisfied number so there was actually somebody that he was looking at before her, but somehow maybe the first one didn't pan out. I don't really know. I couldn't find out, but she was number two. So, um, then, um, okay, so now that happens and, um, I'm trying to remember where I was at. So, okay, so now the police, they have been for questioning, you know, and they're asking him, like, what's going on? Like, why do you have these pictures of these girls? And what's going on with the news? Like, what are you doing? And Jamie just says that he can't remember. He has no idea. He doesn't remember that girl being at his house. And he doesn't remember looking at any of the pornography that they found that he was looking at on his computer at his parents' house. And then he tells him that you know, the thoughts of strangulation, they're not really all that important. He doesn't really think about it all that much. And that they really, you know, shouldn't be making such a big deal out of it. So then the police, they go and they contact Jamie's parents. And they let them know that, hey, your son is accessing your computer at home. And he is looking up these really sick sites and he's trying to bring them to fruition. And his parents are horrified. So his parents, they try to block um, him being able to access uh, like extreme pornography or pornography just in general. And they install parental controls. But Jamie is so smart that he's able to overwrite this and he would bypass the server and he would install his own routers. So when he did that, he would just continue to watch like this extreme uh, pornography. Um, but he did it when his parents weren't at home. So they were under the impression that he was not doing it. They had no idea he was still doing it. So as I said, all they did to Jamie when this happened was re 
refer him to um, something called Youth Offender and then like mental health services and they just cautioned him like that was it another time um, this is now 2011 and Jamie was making well he liked a girl a girl that he worked with I'm not sure if it was at that petrol station um, it didn't really say but so he works with this girl and it starts off very similar to the relationship that he had with Georgia with him showing her that he's interested and it kind of went down the same path where this girl was like listen I really think you're a nice guy but you know I only think of you as a friend and you know I don't want to date you and he would bombard her with text messages and send her gifts and, and all that and she finally got fed up with it one day and she told him, look, this is never going to happen and so he takes his car, he puts it in reverse at full speed and rams into her car yeah, so when that, when that happened um, the police did nothing absolutely nothing and um after that girl reported it there was a picture of that same girl that he just ran into that was found on jamie's hard drive again it was digitally altered with a noose around her neck so in february um 2013 jamie manages to get another young teenage girl to his house and his parents were away two days before he got that girl there he had altered a facebook uh, picture of that girl too again with the rope around her neck but her hands and her feet this time but jamie at that same time was trying to coax georgia to come to his house so once the other girl got to Jamie's house, um, Jamie ends up locking all the doors. The girl was trapped um, for over an hour. She was trapped in his house for over an hour. And Jamie tried to get her to stay the night. But she was like, nope, I'm not doing that. I want to get out of here. So she became really scared and she started screaming and she threatened that she was going to jump out of the window. So when she threatened that she was going to jump out of the window, Jamie then realizes that his plan had failed and he pretended to find the keys that he had said because he had said he lost the keys earlier. He had no idea where they were. So now when she threatens to get out of the jump out the window oh all of a sudden he has his keys now so the girl was finally able to leave the house and she was not harmed at all but jamie that when that happened jamie wrote a reminder to himself to remove the ore from the from the thing that it was on which meant that he had plans of killing this girl just like he killed Georgia. So because that girl got away, now Georgia was the next victim. But he still had plans for other girls. But because he went through with it and killed her, he canceled those plans with those girls. But he didn't cancel them indefinitely. He canceled them for later on in the week. So he planned on he was definitely about to become a serial killer so and also too there were at least four other girls besides those girls there were also four other girls that jamie knew that he um you, you know digitally altered those pictures as well so these were all things that the police and social services knew about yet jamie was only given warning after warning six different agencies knew about these crazy obsessions but 
absolutely nothing to stop him. If the police and the social services had coordinated their information, registered him earlier as a sex offender, and monitored his actions, then Georgia would have known about his background and her life would have been saved, but none of that happened. So because nothing was ever done, Jimmy was able to continue harming people and kept carrying on with his fantasies and he had plenty of time and opportunity to carry them out. On May... Oh my god, my throat! I don't know what is going on. On May 26th of 2013, um, Jamie's parents uh, were away around that time when all of this was going on. He contacted 16 teenage girls and he invited them all to his house to take part in that photo shoot. And out of the 16, 10 of them were willing to help him. 10 of them were coming out to help him later on in the week. So now he's being, um, he's going through his sentencing after pleading guilty. So the judge takes into consideration the evidence of his previous behavior and the judge tells him that he's empowered to pass um, a life imprisonment term and he's going to do it and then the judge goes on to explain that Georgia was only 17 at the time and she was legally a child. Jamie was over 21 and legally an adult. So the court, um, they needed to consider that if the offense is exceptionally serious and the offender is over 21, then the appropriate starting point is a life sentence over there. It is called a whole life order. So, right now I have to read to you because I could never ever remember this. Um, so let me read you what the judge handed down. He said that sentence of this type would typically fall into either of the following categories. The murder of two or more people, where each murder involves a substantial degree of premeditation or planning in sexual sadistic conduct, or the murder of a child involving abduction or sexual sadistic motivation. George's murder falls, in, falls within the second of these descriptions. The judge also explained it also had a large number of aggravating factors. George's murder was long anticipated and planned, not only in the commission, but the steps taken to avoid detection. The crime was designed to give sexual pleasure. Jamie watched Georgia die when he could have saved her, which is all part of his sexual gratification. Georgia would have suffered physically and mentally knowing that she had been betrayed by someone she trusted and would not have died instantly. By dumping her body in a remote spot far from home, naked, without burial, intending it not to be found for a long time, meant Jamie showed contempt for his victim. Jamie had planned for two other teenaged girls to come over the following day with a similar scenario in mind had he not succeeded in killing Georgia. The judge said, killing Georgia, by the way, I'm having to read this bit because I couldn't remember this. Um, the judge said killing Georgia was an expression of Jamie's long-standing preoccupation with a violent, sadistic pornography. Justice Wilkie 
also considered the mitigating factors. He explained that although Jamie had pled guilty, this wasn't until five days before the trial, so the judge did not place much significance on the admission and showed no leniency. Also, Justice Wilkie considered Jamie's age, which he deemed essential for two reasons. First, the impact on a whole life term, which could be regarded as much higher for someone that young. Second, the court should be fully aware of any issues which arise relating to majority and understanding that may affect culpability on considering young adults. The judge carefully considered the conclusions of the psychiatric report. However, the judge found nothing to suggest that Jamie's level of culpability was lowered. Ultimately, the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating ones, and so because of the seriousness of the offense, whole life order was passed. Jamie Reynolds will remain in prison for the rest of his life, which, based on his age, could be upwards to of a 60 years. Because of his potential to become a serial killer, Jamie Reynolds was sentenced to a full life sentence, meaning he will never be released. In the UK, this is a very rare sentence, with only about 100 offenders serving a full life sentence. Jamie Reynolds is among the youngest with this sentence. So, that's it. I know it's very, very frustrating to hear about a case like this, but I also think it's really, really important to, um, you know, hear about things like this. Maybe, you know, people as a whole can start making and affect some changes somehow. I mean, people, people all day long are, um, creating petitions and going on change.org and creating things sometimes, you know, just to make sure things like this don't happen. And I feel like as much as, you know, this was brutal to hear about and not, you know, it's just, it's, I don't really like doing, um, crimes where, or telling about crimes where, um, where like several girls are incapacitated or they, they, um, you know, they're quartered, they can't get out. I, I specifically try to stay away from that, but I realize with true crime being what it is, I may not be able to stay too, too far away from that, but I do try. Um, so, also too, I don't know what the hell was going on with my throat the entire time I was trying to do this. Like, I swear to God, my throat never makes these noises. Not ever like during the day ever it never makes that noise and then for some reason when i'm trying to record to do this it's doing all kinds of weird funky stuff i don't know why it could be because you know i'm not feeling well and i felt late a little sick or something but it's really frustrating so i hope i'm going to listen back to it and if i get annoyed myself with it you know, which I probably will, because, you know, we are our own harshest critics. I probably will be like, nope, I have to do this over again because of my stupid throat noises. And my right um, ear thing, earbud, fell out. It wouldn't go back in. So I had a host of problems, and I really wanted my first recording to be really good. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'll have to edit that out. If I didn't, then I just didn't, I guess. I don't know. Okay, so thank you so much for listening. If you still are, I apologize for all my quips and quibbles, all my mistakes, and um, I just wanted to get something out So because I'm working on other things, and I didn't want you guys to think I forgot about uploading because I haven't. So thank you for listening. I appreciate each and every one of you. I love your comments. If you notice, I always, always, always not just hit the uh, like button or love button, whatever you call it, but I also comment back because I think it's important to have kind of like a dialogue with the people that are 
essentially.